Welcome to Parkside at Home. I'm Deborah, And my name is Matt. Very excited that you're joining us today. If you would, pull out your phone and just shoot a text to 864-351-6555. Uh, that's our new texting platform that we're very excited about. It lets us know that you're watching, gives us an opportunity to say, hey, we're not going to blow up your phones with text, <laughs> right? Uh, again, it just lets us connect with you. Yeah, it's not a group text either, which those are... It's <laughs> not. Yeah, there's always that one person that just keeps on texting. That might be you. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so we want to say thank you so much for your generosity and how you've partnered with Parkside over the years. It means so much to us. And the reason that we get to do what we do week in and week out is because of how much you give and how much you have supported us over the years. So thank you so much for doing that. If you would like to give, you can always do that anytime safely and securely online at parkside.life slash give. Yeah, so it's because of your giving that we're able to do some really cool things that you've been hearing about since the beginning. And one of those is coming up here in just a couple of weeks. It's our women's retreat on September the 28th. Yeah, it's going to be a great time for women to gather and to learn together and to grow together um, in relationship, but then also in your walk with the Lord. And so we would love for you to join us. We would love for you to join us and bring a friend. Um, I think it's going to be a great day. We're going to eat together. I think we're going to um, hang out and do some fun things. And we're also just going to have some really incredible teaching that I think that you're really going to enjoy. So if you go to parkside.life, uh, you can find more information there. We would love to have you. Yeah, so we just wrapped up this series all about kind of cultural Christianity, right? And getting out of that, that rut, maybe defining the difference between cultural Christianity, what the world says, right? And what scripture says. And we're going to lean even further into that in this new series called Holy as I Am yeah, Holy. Excited. Yeah, it's all about holiness and how we can step into the life that God has called us to live in this world. So very excited about it. Uh, hope you get some really good things out of it. That God is speaking to you in some new ways. Let us know, all right? We're looking forward to seeing you soon. Good morning, church. Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, after last week, I wasn't sure what to expect from you guys this week. So hopefully that energy that you had last week, uh, you've come today with um, so I'm going to jump right in because we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, so we're at, look, if you're a note taker, get ready because we, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So let's, let's hop in together. We spent the last month talking about the dangers, the trials and travails of, um, cultural Christianity. And we ended that series with, with talking about if, if we're going to combat, if we're going to fight uh, cultural Christianity in our own lives, it begins with looking in the mirror. But when we look in the mirror and kind of identify those markers of a cultural Christianity, the best way we can fight it is with the pursuit of holiness. And so we want to continue like kind of the next phase of that conversation starting today, where over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what holiness looks like. And in today's conversation, we're going to start in some really big terms. We're going to look at an overview of what holiness is, and we're going to start to dive into some practical elements. But I've, in order to really to have this conversation, we've got to start with answering the question is, what is holiness? What is God's holiness? And how does it interact with our lives? And I know that's a tall order. And I, look, I'm, I'm intimidated by this. If I'm being really honest with you because it's such a big conversation. And, and in, in the church world and the way that we've grown up and even just with the culture the way it is right now, it seems like this conversation makes people really, really nervous. But even my own introduction to the idea of the doctrine of holiness was a little weird. Because in my mind, the doctrine of holiness was all about striving for perfection. And honestly, the struggle I had with it was it's seeming, it seemed like it was an exercise in futility. My introduction to what I didn't know at the time was, was holiness. I was about 13 years old. And I remember inter interacting with this idea that, that, that the Lord, you know, called us to be perfect. In some translations of the Bible, when it says holy, it says perfect. And I really struggled with this idea of how could I be perfect if I had already failed in that endeavor? What was the point of trying something that I knew that I was going to fail at? And I remember sitting across the desk from my youth pastor, his name was Gary, and saying, like, like, what is the point? And his response to me was something that has stuck out to me uh, throughout those uh, long years now, lots and lots of years. And he said to me, God doesn't want you to be perfect. He wants you to try. And now that was an oversimplified explanation, but it was perfect for a 13 year old because at that time, the most important things in my life were snacks and pretty girls, as it is with most 13 year old boys. 
like I said, it was, it was oversimplified, but it was, it was life-changing for me. It, it's something that stuck with me now. I'm, I'm 42, so it's been with me for, for quite a number of years. And I think we need to really begin to understand why this conversation, why the idea, the doctrine of holiness is so important. Holiness and sanctification may be big church word, big church words, but God's call to live as holy people set apart has not diminished, even though the world's appetite for holiness has. And when I say the world, I don't just mean like the world. I mean even the worlds that we live in. Even, even in Christian circles, the appetite for holiness has diminished. And this is a moment where we need to be really, really honest. And we can say to ourselves, holiness has taken a backseat in our world, in our culture, in Christian culture. There's definitely, over the last 15 or 20 years, I would say, there's been this move towards authenticity, but away from transformation. Like, those two things can't exist. We celebrate when someone owns their issues. We celebrate when, when people it, it, in roles like mine stand up and, and be transparent and, and own their issues. But we stop sort of holding each other accountable to life change. We love to say things like, come as you are. God loves you exactly how you are, but we stop short of, of any kind of expectation that we grow or be different than what we currently, what we currently are. Now we're comfortable with Jesus being our friend who sits closer than a brother, but we no longer revere him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I think we do refer, we like to refer to Jesus as the King, Jesus King, King of King in a certain context, in a certain light. I think we like to refer to him as King Jesus when we feel like he's on our side. Like when we have an advocate, when he's kind of standing over our shoulder, when, when the world or the enemy is attacking us and like, I've got King Jesus on my side, but we don't kind of turn that around and remember he is our king and he should be revered as such that not that, that he serves us in our purpose and our ends. But God's holy, God is holy and his call to holiness is very much still active it hasn't diminished. It hasn't changed. Scripture has not changed. It is still there. And I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to give the wrong impression, but I do think the holiness of God should invoke in us a, a respect-based fear. Uh, you, you certainly, God doesn't intend for you to cower from him, right? Like Adam and Eve did when they, when they messed up and they were in the garden and they're like, he's like, where are you? And they're hiding from him. I don't think that's the way God wants to interact with him, but, but he is still God. He's still King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the creator of all things. He's, he's not just a friend. He's also my king. I mean, when the Israelite children, when, when they spoke his name, like there was so much reverence. In fact, they, there was fear about speaking his name improperly for they were worried that it would, it would cause them to be struck down. How many people in the Bible respond to God's holiness by immediately falling to their knees? I thought about this, the, the moment that I, I, I feel like I saw someone respond to God's holiness to his, to, in, in reverence in, in like the most tangible way for me. Years ago, um, I was working at a church in Indiana. Uh, the pastor was a good friend of mine, and he was in school. I think he was getting his master's, and he had to go to different kinds of religious services for a class. And he said, hey, I've got to go to a Jewish uh, Shabbat service. Will you go with me? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And so we went, and we hung out, and it was a really good time. And I don't know if you know much about Jewish services. I didn't. I knew next to nothing at the time, so I was just kind of like, what do I do? Where do I go? Uh, and then at the end, when they gave us communion, I was like, this is confusing to me because, anyways, uh, that's a whole different conversation. But one of the things that blew me away was we were there was a small number of people kind of in a side room. It was not a normal time that they have service. And they have these big cabinets that have scrolls in them, and that's that's the word. They they read from the word um, together, and they have them on these big scrolls, and they have them in these large cabinets, and, and it's supposed to be like this this separate holy thing. And two or three seats down from me was a, was a, a gentleman who was in a wheelchair. He had no use of his legs and very limited use of his arms. And in Jewish tradition, when the scrolls come out, you stand up. You show respect and honor and reverence to the holiness of God's word. 
And when the cabinets opened and the rabbi pulled out the scrolls, I just kind of out of the corner of my eye and I noticed movement. I turned my head and saw this man who, who in, in any circumstance, people would say, you don't have to move. Your, your disability limits you. You're, you're totally fine. He takes his arms and pushes himself up on the arms of his wheelchair because he had to stand as best he could in the presence of God's word. And I just remember being awestruck, awestruck at, it didn't seem like tradition. It didn't seem like habit. It seemed like the holiness of God compelled this man to stand as he could. And I think about times in my own life when I've been asked to consider kneeling in the presence of God in a service or something like that. And I've thought things that I'm embarrassed to tell you. I've thought things like, man, this floor is kind of dirty. I don't want to get my pants dirty. Uh, As I've gotten older, I've thought, man, my back will hurt if I stay down there too long. I think there are moments I've missed out on just being reverent in the holiness of God's presence, especially when singing to him or being in a service or, or the reading of his word. Now, I also wanted to just take a moment to, to talk about that there's kindness in the holiness of God. There's not just this, that he's the Lord. That's how my grandfather would speak when he prayed. He always deepened his voice a couple octaves. But there, there's kindness and there's softness in God's holiness well. It, it's one of the things that makes him worthy to follow. He's not a tyrant that rules on high. The heart of God's message in this world is do as I do. That's one of the distinctions between Christianity and all other world religions. World religion, other world religions are like do as I tell you to do. And there's an element of that with, with, with God, with, with Yahweh, but, but he's the example. He says do as I do. We've heard it said our entire lives that, that, that the Bible is God's love letter to us. And it's the most direct way for us to gain understanding and also get to know God. And that's where we learn that God is love. And scripture literally says that God is love. He doesn't do love, right? It's not, it's not a verb for him. It describes who he is, his very nature. And I, and I love that. I think we all do. But the Bible also says that God is holy, in fact, in Isaiah and Revelation, it says that God is holy, holy, holy. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's nowhere in Scripture where it says God is love, love, love. Remember last week we talked about the importance of, of repetition in God's Word, that it, it creates emphasis. It's God's holiness that drives all his other characteristics. These characteristics that we hold on to, that, that we adore so much. His, his love, his goodness, his justice, his mercy are all derived from his holiness. As I was thinking about this, I asked the Lord, like, can you, can you kind of lead me to a passage that, that, that sums up your holiness? And what's crazy is that holiness is, it, it, the scripture is about holiness as much as it is about his love. But I, I, I found this passage that I had, I'd read numerous times. I, I think as I read it, it best captures the essence of the holiness of God. And it's found in Isaiah chapter six, if you want to turn there. For the thing I think stuck out to me, it's, it's descriptive language. It, it engages more than just my intellect. It engages senses for me. It adds depth and richness that go beyond word on a page for me. Like for me, it's very visual. And I want to read it together. And I think in light of what we talked about in the moment, the, the, the holiness and reverence of God's word, we don't do this often here, but I'd like for us to stand as we read God's word together. So if you're able, please stand, and the words are going to be on the screen, and I'm not going to ask you to read it aloud, but um, we're going to read it together. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled his temple. Above him were seraphim, with each with six wings, two wings that covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled or is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, 
With it, he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. Lord, thank you for your word. You guys can have a seat. As I mentioned a moment ago, I, I love the imagery of this passage. I, 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 in my mind, I see the train of his robe just kind of filling the temple and flowing around in the space. I see, I see it filled with smoke, symbolizing again his presence and his holiness. I, 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 I just love it. I, I, the seraphim, which are kind of weird looking creatures in my mind, covering themselves in the presence of God, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I, I feel the reverence of this moment. As I was studying this passage, I, I came across a really interesting perspective from a pastor in Indiana. His name is Steve Deneff. And he wrote a book called The Way of Holiness. And he uses this passage as a, as a backdrop to, to really dig in and define the holiness of God. He said, uh, and there's a, a, a quote that I want to share with you. He said, uh, to say that God is holy uh, is to say at least four things that pull against one another. Holiness, as God embodies it in Jesus, is not one of these things, uh, but a sign of all four of these things. Where the holiness message of the past has failed has been in the places where we've em emphasized only one or two of these things in neglect of the others. If we're going to try to pursue holiness, then we have to do our best to understand it. And Steve Deneff uh, illustrates this, this, this principle by asking us to imagine two intersecting lines, one going north and south and one going east and west. And at the crux is the holiness of God. And I actually want to share this, this, this illustration with you guys. And at the end of each of these lines, north and south, east and west, there's a, there's a component of God's holiness that's designed to push and pull against one another. Like I said, all four of these components are represented in this passage, and we're going to kind of walk through this passage together in the next little bit and, and just look at these different components, what they're called, and how they push and pull against one another to, to kind of enter, enter in that, 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 that intersection and say, this is the holiness of God. So the first part, the first component we see right just in the first part of verse 1, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. This illustrates the holiness of God as separation, as separation. Isaiah saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. We have to remember that there is a line of demarcation between us and God. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that he is God and we are not. There's so many examples in the Old Testament where, where, the, where inappropriate interaction with God meant death. This was not God being mean. This was not God being judgmental. This was not this, this mean old God sitting on the throne that says, you can't approach me. It just meant that there was, there was holiness, there was reverence, there was a right way to go about things. And until he allowed it, his holiness was too much for us to handle. We could not be in the presence of it. In both First and Second Samuel, men died because of inappropriate interaction with the Ark of the Covenant. And I don't know about you, maybe it's my age. Whenever I interact with this thought, I can't help but see Raiders of the Log Ark going in my mind. There's like one specific scene where that I will never be able to get out of my memory. We need healthy reconnection with an extraordinary God again. Like He's not... In, in our efforts to keep him relevant, we have made him common. I mean, he's something that we have access to every day. I, I love when the Bible calls us to, to pray without ceasing. And the way that's worked out in my own life is, is that look, the Lord and I have lots of small conversations throughout the day in, in crazy places. Like I'm driving, I'm sitting at the stop sign, or I'm, I'm in the shower in the morning, or I'm in the drive through way too often. Like just we'll have these small conversations. And I love that he has that kind of approachability. And I'm glad that he's there all the time, but he is not common. His very essence 
is extraordinary. And we re- re- need to reconnect with those things. But it doesn't mean we need to become monks either that live in this belief that the only way we can truly connect with God is to be completely separate from anything to do with the world. He is separate, but he is still approachable. We need to remember the holiness of God does create separation between creator and created, and we need to honor that because he is God and we are not. Holiness is separation. Looking at the rest of verse 1 through verse 4, we see the second component. Um, and it says, and the train of the robe filled, or the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And to the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Here we see that what creates Tension with separation is holiness as participation. He is separate, but involved. He's on a throne, exalted on high, but the, but the train of his robe fills the temple. His presence is representative of smoke. He is present and engaged. And we see this over and over in Scripture. God invites his children to be present with him. He is holy and re- and should be revered as something separate from us, but he invites us into his presence over and over again. Exodus, in Exodus, he invited Moses to come worship with him in, at the base of the mountain and then asked him to build a sanctuary for him. He instructed Solomon to build a temple. He wants to be with us. He wants us to want to be with him. But the best example of God's desire for, to be with his children is the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't know if we, because it's become commonplace, even though it shouldn't be, I don't know that we always remember that, that Jesus is God incarnate. Come to be with us. God with us. Emmanuel. He did that for us. But he also did it again with the Holy Spirit. When, when Jesus' earthly work was done, he didn't leave us on our own and go back to the throne on high. He sent the other part of himself, the Holy Spirit. And <laughs> the Holy Spirit, like holy isn't the Spirit's first name. It describes his nature. It, it's who he is. His, his nature, separate from us, but also dwelling with us. God participating with us reminds us that there is holiness found in community. He, he calls us to be with him and he, and he places us in, in this expectation where we're supposed to kind of do holiness together. We need social holiness, holiness that displays grace and vulnerability, holiness that is gritty and is willing to do the hard and dirty work, that's willing to get a little bit messy because guess what? People are messy. Holy people who are willing to do more than just pray for the lost pray for the broken and pray for the hurting people who are willing to help them be found, to be healed and to find peace. God's holiness no longer just dwells in the temples. It doesn't just dwell in the sanctuaries. We are the temple. We are little chapels that are supposed to go out into the world and and, and be uh, a representation of God's presence in this world. But generation after generation, we kind of swing from one thing to Another. Holiness is separation. Holiness is also preparation. But those aren't the two only tension points that we need to look at together. There's two other components that push and pull against one another. Verses five through seven point out this next component. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And one of the seraphim flew down uh, to me and gave a, and, and, uh, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And when he touched, touched, with it, he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. This is where we see holiness as purity. This is a moment where we see Isaiah's response to the presence of God. Woe to me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. It's easy to see Isaiah's self-deprecating approach to God's holiness 
But what he's really, what he's really pushing towards is purity. Like I have things that are wrong with me and in the presence of God, I need to become clean in order to, to stand in the presence of God, to stand in the presence of his holiness. Isaiah understood that, that to create further separation from God is not what he wanted, that he had to deal with his sin, with his uncleanliness. As disciples, we have to re-engage with the call of Scripture that we talked about last week in 1 Peter. The, the call not to conform to our evil desires, but that happened before we knew better, but to be holy in all that we do. There's a sad reality kind of playing out in our world today that there has been a move away from holiness as purity. I think there are a few factors that contribute to that one. There's definitely a, a moral um, relative. Mm, I tried to say this word last night. Like I, I literally practice it. There's, there's relativity. There it is. That'll be fun to put on the internet later on. It's skewed culture's idea of what right is wrong, what what what's pure and impure. A really stark example of this is pornography. Just in my lifetime, from, from my teenage years, I don't mean my whole lifetime, like from my teenage years till now where I find myself in middle adulthood. That's a fun thought. Just in the last 20 years or so, pornography has gone something that nearly everyone saw as not only morally wrong, but hurtful and harmful. Like in and out of faith, 20, 25 years ago, like society as a whole agreed, this is not, what's best for people. It's wrong, but it's also harmful and hurtful. But here we are 20, 25 years later, and it's moved from like everyone thinking this is not okay to socially acceptable. And I would say right now we're teetering on the edge if we've not crossed the line to its social norm. This is something that I kind of walked through and saw from a really interesting perspective of being a youth pastor for 17 and a half years. To see it move from, we all know this is not good, right? To like, well, well, it happens, and now it's like everybody. And the only thing that's really changed is his accessibility. This is a good example of how we've walked away from purity as holiness as a people. We need to get back to a version of holiness that does not compromise with sin. And we can separate the sin from the people, Right? Like we, we can separate those two things. And I think sometimes we've misused the idea of love that, love the uh, sinner and hate the sin. But, but there is truth that we can separate someone. They are not identified by their sin, but we can, we need to be able to look at each other and say, Hey, look, this is not God's best for you. Especially like when we ask for it, when we walk into community and say, Hey, look, I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to live a holy and pure life. Will you help me? Well, that opens up the door, right? So if I ask for that, then please come kick me in my spiritual mouth when I'm doing something dumb. We've got to get back to this idea of purity as holiness. We can celebrate and applaud honesty and transparency and still hold the ideal of accountability of purity with one another. We can acknowledge our nature and our bend towards sin, but also call ourselves to the standard of holy living that the scriptures lay out. We can live in the grace that asks us to live above our sins, to live in the words of Ephesians 5.12, to present ourselves without spot or wrinkle or to be holy without fault. We can do these things. Here's the final verse of this passage. And with it, we find the final component that sits the opposite side of purity. It's Isaiah uh, Chapter 6, verse 8, Then I heard the Lord saying to me, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. In this verse, we see holiness as passion. I think this moment is really interesting in, in this passage. All these things have been happening around Isaiah. He's, he's seen the Lord sitting on a throne. He's seen the, the train of his robe. He's seen the smoke and the seraphim. And he, he's had this moment where he's been purified. But this, this moment right here at the end of this passage is the first time that God speaks. Isaiah has spoken, the seraphim has spoken, but now God speaks. 
And in this moment, he doesn't, he doesn't speak to the seraphim. He doesn't speak to him being worshipped. In this moment, he asks two questions. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And God didn't reveal himself to Isaiah to, to purify him or to have another a worshiper. It was to prepare him for purpose. That was the, the meaning of his words in that moment. Part of holiness is having passion for God's work, not only in us, but joining him and his work in the world. A recognition and response to the holiness of God should move our hearts, but it should also move our hands. But for many of us, the most passionate thing that we do is occasionally, occasionally invite a friend to church. Like that's kind of the extension of, of how we, we feel like we're supposed to partner with God for his work in the world. Because I'm going to take some of the blame off of you and say, like, I think church has done that for you. Like we, we've told you, hey, all you got to do is you get them to church and we'll take care of the rest. And that's, that's not scriptural. Like I'm not saying don't invite your friends but you may have more of a part to play. Like God has called you to make disciples, not Parkside Church. He's called you to do that. Put yourself in Isaiah's place for a moment. If you're in the presence of God and, he's at, and he would say, who shall I send? Who will go for us? How would you respond? So through this passage, we see these components, these four components of God's holiness. Holiness is separation. Holiness is participation, holiness is purity, and, and holiness as passion. These are the aspects or characteristics or components of God's holiness, but the real beauty is that they live in the right amount of tension with one another. And, and in that tension, right in the center of that tension, we see a complete view of God's holiness. He's not just separate. He, he doesn't just participate. He doesn't, he doesn't just call us or live in purity. He doesn't just call, or, uh, call us to live in passion. He is at the dead center of all. There, there is balance together, not one or the other. But getting them out of balance is where we have messed up. Like looking at this diagram together, like th- th- that's, a, that's perfect because like, because God is perfect. He is holiness. He, like, he's the living example of this. He doesn't get things out of balance. He lives in the right amount of tension. He calls us to the right amount of tension. We have gotten things messed up. There have been times when the church has lived in the purity and separation quadrant and has created legalistic believers who lost their ability or desire to have influence in this world. They said, like, look, we're going to do our own thing. And if, unless you meet us here, you're not living right. But that, that, that falls out of, out of the balance of the, these things are supposed to live together in tension. And at times, and I feel like this is where we've been heading the last couple of decades, is the pendulum has swung too far into the participation and, and passion quadrant. And God has become too small and safe. There is no standard and there is no absolute truth. We need as believers, as disciples, to recapture that balance that God has called us to. Re- remember, in 1 Peter and Leviticus, when God asks us to be holy as he is holy. And he is all four of these things. The pursuit of holiness is what we like to call Christ-likeness. This is what this diagram looks like for us. That, that, that we pull these things together, separation and participation and purity and passion. When we pull them together and when we live in the right tension, we are living a Christ-like life. That's what we are called to. God's holiness in us is holding these things in as best as we can, as we can muster tension with one another. For us being Christ-like is find the balance of all four of these components of holiness. Find that sweet spot of reverence for God as king and creator, but also stepping into his approachability. That balance of being able to live a higher moral standard based on scripture, but also being grounded in this world that he's called us to, that he's called us to engage with. How are you striking that balance? Are you leaning a little too far one way or the other, north or south, east or west? This is the question I want you to wrestle with over the next few days. Over the next uh, three or four weeks, we're we're gonna gonna wrestle with some of the more practical sides of holiness. And 
you guys know me, like I'm, I'm, I'm practical, I'm pragmatic in nature. This message was tough because it, this, like I literally had wrote out like, these are three things you can do with all this information. And God said, nope, that's for later. We, we just had to, to, to deal with this today. To understand that, that holiness is, is not one thing or the other. It's these things that live in harmony with one another. But I did want to ask you that question. Is like, if, you know, God's holiness is set in stone, it is what it is. Like, we have no part in that. There's nothing we can do to change that. Not that we would want to, but, but He is God, we are not. But our part in that is Christ likeness and trying to find the balance of these four things. And I want you to think over the next few days about how you are doing, how you're striking that balance. Are, are you leaning a little bit towards that participation or passion quadrant where, where it really doesn't matter what we do? Cause that's the way culture's heading. Or are you, are you recognize that? So you're actually going the other way where you, you feel like we need to be separate and pure. How do we find that balance? I want you to think about the holiness of God and how you're walking into that call to be holy as well. Thanks again so much for joining us here at Parkside at Home. I hope that you were challenged and I hope that you heard from the Lord. I know this idea of holiness can be challenging and for some of us it can also maybe bring up some feelings about church or the Lord that maybe we wrestle with. And you know what? That's okay. We're here for that. But I hope that the Lord is speaking to you. I hope that you're learning something. If you have questions or want to have a conversation more about this, let us know, reach out. We would love to connect with you. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you again soon.